Whenever I find myself interested in a platformer, it was usually the character design that hooked me. A lot of platformers design characters that are representative of the abilities you'll have in the game. Rayman's detached limbs let him literally throw his punches, Glover's all about bouncing and throwing balls, and Kazooie uses her wings to give Banjo extra airtime. Whenever I used to browse games at the store as a kid, I would always pick something with a character that looked fun to play as, which is probably why my eyes brushed over Rocket without much thought each and every time. A uh, unicycle robot thing with no arms. Uh, you know, come to think of it, it's not really a robot on wheels as much as it's a robot on a wheel, but I guess it doesn't really roll off the tongue as well, huh? I don't know, I just never really thought much of this design because it never really communicated to me what it can do. It never really painted an interesting picture of what I would find myself doing as this character. A classic case of judging a book by its cover, I guess, but you'd be surprised who wrote the book. Sucker Punch, yeah, the guys behind the Sly Cooper series, even going on to become a first party triple A studio with Sony, making the infamous games well after. These are games I do really like. The Sly Cooper series is fantastic, and the the infamous games are really good too. It's a wonder why I never went back to their original project on N64 to see what it was all about. As popular as Sly and Infamous are, I rarely see people talking about Rocket. I don't think it's sold super well, and it's a little bit more pricey than your average N64 cartridge, so it's not incredibly easy to get your hands on it these days. But despite not being too popular back in the day, it does seem to be highly regarded. In their August of 2008 issue, Volume 131, Nintendo Power counted down the 20 best games from each console for their 20th anniversary, and they ranked Rocket the 18th best N64 game of all time. Oh wow, they ranked it above Pokemon Snap. I guess this game isn't really that remembered by many, but the people that do remember it seem to think really highly of it. I mean, it has to be at least good, right? It was made by Sucker Punch after all, but maybe that's a little bit naive to assume. Not everybody's first game's a really good one, but I don't know, why don't we check this thing out and see for ourselves? The title screen's got this big sweeping shot of an amusement park. It looks really nice, especially the colors. They look really good. So the story begins with the park owner explaining that it's the night before the grand opening of Whoopi World, the happiest theme park in the galaxy. He leaves the control room in the hands of Rocket, this like service droid, I guess, uh, overnight so he can attend a party. Everything's automate. Wait, wait, are those subtitles freaking Comic Sans? Yeah! Yeah, Sonic, you would know. Anyway, uh, everything's automated, so all Rocket has to do is keep an eye on all of the tokens and tickets and feed the park's mascots, the titular Whoopi, this big lazy walrus, and Jojo, the little raccoon dude with a, he's got like a hat and tie, I like that a lot. Wait a minute, Rocket, raccoon? I know these guys did draw a lot of influence from comic books for Sly and Infamous, so that makes me wonder if that really was a coincidence or not. This little raccoon is sick and tired of living in Whoopi's shadow, so he hatches a plan to take over the amusement park and make it JoJo World instead. I mean, why should this lazy walrus be the star of the show when the raccoon's the one who does all the work? I mean, that could be a little assumption on my part, but he seems to be pretty mad, so that's probably his mindset. Bye-bye, be good. Yeah, be good, my ass. <laughs> Jojo escapes, kidnapping Whoopi and taking all of the tokens and tickets so the park can only open on his terms. It's now up to Rocket to make his way through each theme park world, recollect all the tokens and tickets, and stop Jojo by tomorrow morning so the park can open like planned. I really like the plot, it's really silly, which is really fitting for a game about a theme park, and the characters are really great too. A Jojo probably looks a little bit familiar, doesn't he? I mean, it's a raccoon drawn by the same character artist as Sly Cooper, right? Sly is a original concept was actually pretty close to JoJo's. They practically reused the design. They even had a way chunkier, more raccoon-like model at one point. And as a little callback, Sly 2 has a number of Rocket references, including a gravestone that says, Rest in Peace, Rocket. They also hid JoJo's and Rocket's character models in this crypt here. If you destroy everything in the room and then stand right here and look over here, the model will magically spawn in. That's really cool. I always love it when developers give their previous works a little shout. Uh, you might remember Infamous having a bunch of Sly 
Cooper Easter eggs. They hinted at Sly 4 being a thing long before that announcement, and Cole's got a little Sly Cooper button on his backpack. Infamous 2 and Second Son were also no stranger to Sly Cooper references. I guess when developers really love their own work, that's a pretty good sign that there's some legitimate passion involved, so let's see if that passion made a good game here. The very first thing I notice here is how good the physics feel. Like, uh, when you jump, there's this defined weight to it. It's kind of hard to explain without having you actually hold a controller and hitting the buttons for yourself, but uh, the way the character pulls his legs up when you reach the peak of your jump and how he bobs downwards when you land, there's, there's like this buoyancy here that feels really good. And this carries on over into performing jumps whenever you're platforming. I was really surprised, but I was able to make really accurate jumps with total ease, and the momentum from your prior movement, it carries on over into each jump exactly as you'd expect it to. There's no guesswork here. I always felt like I was in total control of how far I'd go. I talked a little bit about the character design being representative of the character's abilities at the start of this video, but now that I've got my hands on this thing, I'm starting to understand that this character was not designed with the abilities in mind, but instead with the physics in mind. But that doesn't mean that Rocket doesn't have many abilities. Aside from jumping around, you've also got a tractor beam you can use to pick up and throw objects, which, again, is a mechanic designed with physics in mind. There's a lot of chucking objects around and picking stuff up and bringing it somewhere else, like maybe bringing screws to an object you have to fix, or chucking bombs at walls you'll have to blow up. Be careful with the bombs, though, because if they bump something, it's gonna blow up in your face. Whenever you're holding something, it'll bob around a little bit as you move, once again taking advantage of the physics, and because of this, they're able to have the bomb bump into stuff if your reckless movement makes it weave away into something. It feels really natural, it's kinda cool. You can also use the bombs to take out enemies, but I was having a real hard time landing the throw, so then I thought, wait a minute, instead of throwing the bomb at the enemy, I'll throw the enemy at the bomb! And it worked! I, I felt like a genius after figuring that out. And then I felt like an idiot after I remembered you can just grab the enemy and use a ground pound move. Sometimes they get pretty creative with what you'll do with these grabbable objects. Like this sequence here where you have to hit a button to magnetize the wall and then toss these metal boxes at it to create platforms within a time limit. It's fun as hell to do. As you make your way through the game, you'll pick up these tinker tokens which you can trade in to get new abilities. These range from the before mentioned ground pound move to an ice beam you can use to freeze things, a grappling hook, and a simple double jump. I feel like double jumps are one of the least interesting moves you can put in a platformer. So many freaking games have this exact same move. I don't know, I'd rather something more interesting, and I feel like being able to cancel all of your momentum mid-jump to always land exactly where you want takes a lot of the challenge away. Like in Mario 64, for example, the dive gives you more distance, but it's risky. You can overshoot something, which makes getting good at using it all the more satisfying. Thinking back to a hat in time, I'm starting to realize how challenging that game isn't because you can just cancel that dive immediately with a double jump and just land it every time. I'm not like trying to mark this as a take against the game or anything, I don't think double jumps are inherently a bad thing, I would just personally prefer something a little bit more interesting, that's all. What I do really love about this game's moveset though is how the game never forgets about any of your moves. Later on into the game, they still create obstacles that require using everything in your arsenal, often in more challenging ways than before. The ice beam, for example, you use it to freeze chunks of water to create platforms you can jump on, but later on, you're not doing just that, you're also avoiding electric fences at the same time. Or you can just figure out that you can make one at the bottom of the pool and use it to float to the top and skip the whole thing. Each world offers unique gimmicks and stuff too, and there's a really good variety in both that and the themes of level sport. Whoopi World is the game's hub world, and from there you'll access a variety of theme parks, starting with a typical amusement park called Clown World, uh, there's an ancient Greece theme park, there's a mine, an Arabian world, an Aztec level, and a Halloween park. The levels themselves are all fairly open-ended instead of being linear stages, so it's closer to something like Mario and Banjo than something linear like Rayman 2 or Glover or whatever. You'll explore around freely looking for any puzzles or objectives and stuff you can complete. In the Clown World, there's a part where you play this little ball throwing carnival game for a ticket. This one one's awesome. You gotta build a roller coaster that makes it through all of the numbered rings, and then you get to ride it. That's cool as hell. I'm really glad the game follows in banjo steps by not booting you from the level every time you get a ticket. Rocket just does a little celebration animation, and then you get to go right back to exploring. These are what you'll use to unlock more levels, which kind of makes a lot of sense. It fits the whole carnival theme, so this is pretty much, you know, the game's equivalent of uh, stars or jiggies or whatever. In addition to getting one ticket per objective completed, there's also an extra ticket in every world if you can collect all 
200 tokens. These ones are a big pain in the ass, but at least they don't respawn every time you leave the level or die, so thankfully you don't have to get them all in one run. God, that was irritating as hell in some of those levels. You're probably gonna skip out on these ones because hunting down every last token in a level is really freaking tedious, and hey, you can do that because you only have to collect so many tickets to unlock the next level. There's plenty of wiggle room here, so if there's an objective you don't feel like doing or a ticket you're having a hard time finding, you'll still be able to make do with the ones you have. This, of course, is the same wonderful structure that Mario 64 and Banjo use, which is for good reason, because in my opinion, it's the ideal way to progress in a collectathon, giving the player the freedom to pick and choose what they do and don't want to do. You know what you are probably going to want to do, though, is drive these vehicles. Every single level has one or two unique vehicles you can drive, and again, these feel really good to operate because the physics and the controls are both really good. The first one's this little buggy car thing, you can use it for just getting around the level faster, but there's also a race you can... I just realized this car's a hot dog. I like that. Other vehicles include this robotic dolphin dude for swimming around, you get a forklift thing for moving these big blocks, a magic carpet for flying around the level, they all feel totally different from one another and they're all really fun to drive and complete objectives with in their own right. But the best one by a mile, bar freaking none, is this motorcycle that sprouts wings and can glide around the stage using the momentum you got from driving, so there's a really good balance between gliding, landing, picking up more speed and taking off again, there's a really good flow to it. And again, the controls in this thing are surprisingly good, and it's so much fun to use. Like, I really love this thing. I would just fly around not even getting anything done because of how much fun it was just to, to fly and glide and land and... Can Grand Theft Auto have a thing like this, please? I need an open world game that has a vehicle like this. Some of them are more puzzle oriented instead of getting around oriented. I like this one that launches paint at stuff. Uh, this level is really cool. It's an ancient Greece theme level, or maybe it, it's ancient Rome. I can never tell the difference because I'm dumb as hell. But uh, yeah, there's also like these paint cannons where you can fire paintballs at stuff. So it's kind of like a Greek or Rome themed paintball course, which is something you could very well find at a real theme park. And they do some real really cool stuff with it. This one puzzle here has a guard not letting you in because you're not wearing the proper imperial colors or whatever, so you've got to dip yourself in these pools of paint, combining colors to make other colors and jumping in the right sections of the pool to decide whether you want to cover your head or just your body. The Aztec level has this light world and dark world thing going on. The dark world is like a volcano with rivers of lava everywhere, and some puzzles and some platforming sections require switching between the two. Uh, this one puzzle here has you figuring out a combination in the dark world and then going back to the light world to enter it. One detail here I really did love is how when you're in the dark world, all of those illustrations of Jojo change to show his true nature. This is one of the many things that you have to first activate by collecting all of the parts to a machine. Uh, every level has a bunch of these machine parts scattered, and once you find them all, you can unlock a massive chunk of the level. These levels are surprisingly easy to navigate too. I feel like they're the perfect size, like instead of making a giant world, they instead opted out for medium-sized maps that are all tightly packed with landmarks and things to do. Each and every area also looks very unique, with a lot of memorable set pieces to keep your bearings with. Like, I kid you not, I only spent maybe like two hours tops in each of these levels, yet thinking back to them, I can remember all of them like the back of my hand. That right there is the mark of really good world design. The presentation overall is super good, like the attention to detail and the choice in color not only makes each area unique and memorable, but it all looks really good too. Now if there's one fairly sizable problem I had with the game, it's definitely the camera controls. It's not as bad as some other games, but it's certainly not super great. I found it getting caught on some stuff sometimes, it just doesn't really know what to do when there's a wall in the way. I mean, actually controlling the thing is really responsive, at least if there's nothing in the way of it, and the three levels of zoom you have to choose from are perfect. No matter the situation, there's always one of the three that'll give you a perfect view of everything you need. It's just the rotation, it gets stuck on stuff sometimes. And I guess I could have picked a better sound for it too. It's not as annoying as, say, Tonic Trouble's camera sound. <laughs> But like, I don't know, it sounds like a freaking laser beam every time you hit the button.
Once you've collected enough tickets, it's time for the main attraction, the showdown with Jojo Raccoon. Rather than having a final boss fight, you'll instead tackle a long and challenging platforming sequence, and it tests all of the abilities you've learned throughout the game while having a series of set pieces themed after every level you've gone through. It is quite long and difficult though, and you will have to go back to the very beginning if you run out of health, but it is pretty fair. It's also really satisfying to learn each section and get progressively better until you can fly right through it. Except this paint area. God, I hated it so much. You gotta paint yourself the right colors and make your way to the door without a paintball hitting you, which is a really cool idea, but using these spouts to paint yourself with instead of the pools from before is just a paint in the ass. Aside from this though, it was a pretty great final challenge. I love how Jojo reacts when you start getting close to the end. He starts panicking and tries to barter with you so you don't wreck his plans. Once the raccoon is done for, the park owner comes back and thanks Rocket for stopping Jojo's plans. There's still tickets and tokens to find, oh Oh dear, oh dear. Wait, what? There's there's no credits. What, what do, I, do I have to get everything to get the credits? Yeah, you do. This is the one big thing I really don't like about this game. I mean, you can just settle for the standard ending after finishing the final level, but the thing is, without a credit sequence, it just doesn't really feel like you beat the game, you know? If you want to get that, you have to get everything. I guess it's not so bad. Getting all of the tickets is pretty fun, actually. It's no more taxing than getting all of the stars in a Mario game. They're all pretty doable. I didn't really find any of them to stick out as tedious or a chore to do. Except, you know, the ones you get for finding all 200 tokens at a level. Remember those ones? God, these last couple of tickets drove me up the freaking wall. I was running in circles looking for the last couple of these in each level. I must have been combing this level for two freaking hours before finding out it was way up here. How is anybody supposed to find this with the short draw distance? Ah! Once you finally have everything, the park is ready for its grand opening. But the park owner decides to re named the park from Whoopi World to Rocket Land. I think a little robot's earned it after all. It's brief, but it's a nice ending. But I really don't think you should have to collect everything just to get it. I'm all for a fun bonus to reward players for getting everything, but requiring it just to get the credits? That just ain't right. At least the credits are pretty interesting. It's not your traditional text roll. Instead, you land in a room full of portraits of all the developers, and you can pick them up to learn their name. Their expressions even change when you grab them. That's kind of neat. But uh, yeah, aside from that requirement for getting the ending, I'd say this game really shattered my expectations. I totally see why people seem to think so highly of it. Honestly, I'm kind of blown away by how good this thing is, because like, I often come away from these older platformers looking for qualities that I find interesting, even if the execution isn't all that great, I try to appreciate the ideas while still outlining its flaws, but this isn't really a situation like that. This is just a straight up really good game. Honestly, I think out of everything I've gone into blind on this channel, this is my favorite older platformer since Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. The controls and physics are great, the level design is digestible and interesting, and the objectives are creative and a ton of fun to do. Not to mention, the character designs are really appealing. I didn't really think a whole lot of Rocket when I first saw him, but it's not hard to let this cute little robot dude grow on ya. I never really thought much about Sucker Punch's humble beginnings, but good lord dude, they really got a home run right out of the gate here. Rocket Robot on Wheels is easily one of the best platformers on the N64, right up there with Mario. Mario, Banjo, and Rayman. It's a dang crime that this game isn't as talked about as those three. If you're a fan of platformers, you gotta do yourself a favor and play this game. Though it is a little bit harder to get your hands on a cartridge these days, so emulate it, I guess? I don't know, they really gotta re-release this thing so people don't have to resort to that. I mean, like, Sucker Punch is one of Sony's biggest first-party developers right now. Give us an HD remake, or at least a port to modern platforms. I mean, a lot of games I have talked about in the past did get HD ports after I talked about them, like Sphinx and Voodoo Vince, so maybe we'll get lucky again. Who knows? Let's hope. Hey, so like, sorry I kind of looked like a sweaty ball sack this whole video. It was like really hot, and of course I had to turn off all of the fans for the audio recording. <laughs> so, it wasn't really much I could do about that. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching. If you want to support the show, I have a $1 podcast on Patreon. Uh, yeah, I... I th thanks. <laughs>